but, that, but that's all right. So thanks, thanks for everyone for staying home, but, but logging on, I guess, is more appropriate. Um, so I'm going to just give you guys the first, uh, like the opening scene for a story uh, from a story called Endangered Animal Release Specialists. Um, and this is it. Monday morning, I hurry to the intake and assignment meeting, and I tell myself this time, things will be different. This time, my potential and experience will be recognized. This time, I'll be assigned a high profile case. Do I think it'll be a Tibetan antelope or a Mediterranean monk seal? Of course not, though a girl can dream. Still, after months of releasing amphibians, really anything from the class mammalia would feel like a bonus. I just need something to be proud of. Something that lets me feel like the work I'm doing here is making a difference. Something I can counter with when Ma cruelly and inaccurately asks why I'm wasting my life as an animal masturbator. I arrive just as everyone is getting settled and Dr. Farragut is plugging in the projector. When everyone takes their seats and has helped themselves to coffee and a donut, Dr. Farragut begins the meeting. He begins the same way he has every Monday morning for the last six months. How are you, you bunch of jack offs? It's his favorite joke. He still thinks it's hilarious. We all offer a pained smile or obligatory half laugh in response, all of us except Janet. The fire and subsequent scarring and deterioration of the muscles render Janet's face incapable of any real expression. Dr. Farragut says the shiny pink scar tissue makes Janet's face look like a glazed ham, which, while accurate, isn't very nice. Either way, no one expects Janet to pretend to be happy. I envy her. Then the lights go dark and the meeting really begins. Our first intake slide features a long ashen face ringed in copper colored fur. Everybody perks up. Pongo Wabeli, or as he's more commonly known, the Sumatran orangutan is listed as critically endangered. Less than 7,000 remain. This is an extremely high profile case. Lots of potential press, lots of potential notoriety. I know what you're all thinking, Dr. Farragut says, Pongo Belly is a high profile case that will garner a great deal of attention. And as such, I think it's best if I personally handle the release of this animal. No one is surprised. Dr. Farragut always assigns himself the most noteworthy cases. In his office is a framed copy of Conservation Quarterly. Dr. Farragut is on the cover with Ozzy, the Brazilian ocelot he released to much fanfare. The article is titled The Man and the Hands that Have the Ocelot on the Rise. Dr. Farragut had Ozzy autograph the cover by dipping his paws in ink, which to me seems tacky. It's not if I'm not happy for the ocelots. Of course I am, they're beautiful creatures. But it's hard to forget that the day the reporters came and took their pictures and made a big show of everything, I was down in the sub-basement trying to release an extremely uncooperative poison dart frog. But still, through it all, I bide my time and I quietly endure. The next slide shows a familiar face. Duncan is a four-year-old speckled bear on temporary transfer from the Scrant facility. Dr. Farragut tells us Duncan has been recently classified as a problem specimen because he attacks his release specialist. He tells us this as if we all haven't watched the security footage about a million times. At first, things seem to be going well. The release specialist began with some lower abdominal massage. Duncan looked content. Soon, he achieved complete rigidity. The specialist appeared to have a firm but not too firm grip and a steady, even rhythm. That's textbook technique. But then something happened. It's not clear what. Maybe the specialist got lazy or overconfident. Maybe he looked the animal in the eye, which is completely verboten. It's the first thing we learn in orientation. Regardless, Duncan leapt from the release bay, landed on the specialist, and pinned him to the floor. A muffled whimper could be heard over the audio. Duncan inflicted some minor lacerations to the chest and neck area and chewed off the tip of an ear before the boys from control could swarm in with their trank guns. Dr. Farragut reminds us about Duncan's temperament. He warns us to be cautious. Then he assigns Duncan to Janet. I look over to see if Janet is excited or nervous about being given such a challenging animal, but of course I can't tell. I'm next to get an assignment. I close my eyes and hope for a black-footed ferret or an African wild dog. I hear the click of a projector, and then I hear Monroe snort out a laugh. I don't even know what Monroe is doing here. He's not a release specialist. He runs the cryogenics lab. But still, every Monday morning, he's here inhaling the free donuts and then sucking the jelly and powdered sugars from his fingers in a suggestive manner. I open my eyes. 
I see a mosaic of black, brown, and yellow pebbled skin. I see two marbled golden eyes and the distinctive upturned snout that rests between them. Great. The Puerto Rican crested toad, another amphibian. I begin to protest, but Dr. Farragut raises a hand, silencing me. Before you start in with the lack of variety in your release assignments or how you feel underappreciated or how I must have some personal vendetta against you, let me assure you, I do not. Would I love to assign you a pygmy hippopotamus or an African bush elephant? Of course I would. But do you see any African bush elephants around here? Because I don't. Then Dr. Farragut makes a show of looking around the room and under the table as if he simply misplaced an African bush elephant, which is ridiculous. They're huge. I can only assign what we intake, he says. I think about mentioning the orangutan, but I don't. Plus, Dr. Farragut continues, would you prefer Duncan? Would you prefer the bear that may claw your pretty little face off? Not that I believe that will happen, not for a second, but it might. And as such, I have to try to minimize risk. I have to try to minimize the collateral damage in a before and after type of assessment. Am I making myself clear? Janet and I stare blankly ahead. Monroe devours another donut. Then Dr. Farragut sighs and runs a, hair, a hand just over his hair. Not through, but just over. Dr. Farragut is extremely meticulous about his hair. Every light brown strand is slicked back into a smooth dome. It reminds me of the shell of the Yangtze giant turtle, which is also endangered, which is also another animal I'll probably never get my hands on. Okay, Dr. Farragut says, let's say it's raining. It's raining and I have the option between a work boot and a fancy shoe. Maybe the work boot is scuffed up a bit. Uh, maybe the leather's cracked and the sole is loose. You get the idea. The point is, with this particular kind of weather, there's a chance of some destructive and overall disastrous impact befalling one of my shoes. Again, for the record, I believe said danger is unlikely, but the potential is there. Puddles and mud and whatnot. And so, should some damage occur, it'll be less noticeable on the shoe with the aforementioned wear and tear, the work boot. So Janet gets the bear and you get the toad and I have an early lunch. Then Dr. Farragut slaps the table, stands and exits the meeting. I turn to Janet. I wish there was some indication of how she's feeling. She's taking long audible breaths from what's left of her nose. That's well, probably not good. Janet, I say, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I should have never said anything. Unbelievable, she says, standing up so fast your chair rolls back into the plastic ficus. If anyone in this glorified animal bathhouse is a fancy shoe, it's me. Then she spins on her heel and storms out of the room. That's it. Thanks.